Coming up, the LA Times tackles the CBP stops. The story is scathing. Proof that saving airports from closure is worth it in the end. Just what is the latest on the FAA's rule for driver's license medical? And a hangar full of history and a museum stocked with Doolittle Raiders artifacts. It'll be live this week begins in just a moment. And now the nation knows about it. Hello everyone, I'm Tom Haynes. Thanks for watching AOPA Live this week. You can bet the Air and Marine Unit of Customs and Border Protection is paying attention now. The nation's fourth most widely distributed newspaper, the LA Times, this week reported on CBP stopping and searching general aviation aircraft, sometimes for reasons as lame as the aircraft was flying east from California. Well, the issue of warrantless stops and searches of general aviation flights is a national issue, so we're really pleased that it has drawn the attention of mainstream media. We've worked with reporter Dan Weichel before on issues mostly around the Santa Monica Airport issue. He's always been very thorough and very, very fair. And we worked for weeks with him on providing him connections to pilots that have reported to us stops. We've also provided to him a lot of information and data uh, that we've collected over the course of the issue. Uh, as a result of this report, We've got many calls yesterday from uh, radio shows, television shows, and it also, that story found its way to other uh, different web pages and other uh, news sources, digital news sources. So it's important in terms of getting this message out and telling this story. The article reports that of all the flights that CBP has tracked, law enforcement found reasons for arrest in just 3% of the cases. Reporter Dan Weichel quoted AOPA President Mark Baker saying, here we have Big Brother watching. This looks like an agency in search of a mission. But after the article, you can bet more con congressional attention is going to be focused on exactly what the heck Customs and Border Protection is up to. The LA Times most definitely gets attention in Washington. And something else is gaining more attention and support in Washington, the driver's license medical. The General Aviation Pilot Protection Act now has 93 co-sponsors in the House and 10 in the Senate. That proposed law would allow private pilots to fly aircraft weighing up to 6,000 pounds in VFR conditions without a third-class medical certificate. And more members of Congress are signing on because of you. I really have to thank uh, a lot of our AOPA members who have engaged uh, in trying to get uh, their members, their respective members of Congress to support the legislation. And, uh, you know, we did a, uh, a call to action to, you know, almost 400,000 pilots. And we went from about uh, 60 some supporters almost to 100 now. And that's just over a short period of time. Now, there's the law, and then there is the possible change in regulations that the FAA said it would look at. So, what's the status of the FAA effort? You know, obviously, we, we would love to have uh, to do away with a third class medical for all general aviation pilots. I think there's just, it's an old, archaic way of doing business. I think safety will be actually be improved. But what I see going forward is the FAA moving to what we call a rulemaking process. And uh, I, I, I think that the, they should be moving forward this summer. This is going to take longer than we want it to. But I can tell you we're going to keep their feet to the fire. Congress is going to keep their feet to the fire. And we're going to try to get this done as quickly as we possibly can. Well, the pace of the federal government is glacial, and that's an understatement. The FAA has posted their timeline for rulemaking on reducing medical certificate requirements. You see it there on the screen, and if they stay on schedule, well, it'll be November before we even see what they have in mind. And if you want your voice to be heard on that medical reform, you can sign our giant petition. It'll be on display at the AOPA fly-ins and other major aviation events, including AirVenture and Oshkosh. AOPA is leaving no stone unturned in this fight. Well, the FAA this week is trumpeting what they say is a major upgrade, the completion of the ADSB radio network. So is this a big deal? It's sort of like building a super highway across the U.S. The highway is complete. You've got beautiful, beautiful ribbon of concrete. You've got no on or off ramps. So the FAA has completed the initial installation of ADSB ground stations, but less than half of air traffic control facilities are connected to the network and actually able to use the data. And while the next gen promise is for instrument approaches and air traffic control services into airports that haven't had that before, the FAA hasn't yet developed those procedures, 
and they have to build the network out so that, that they're in the areas where we don't currently have radar. But there actually are some current benefits for general aviation pilots from this ADS-B network. And that's in the, in the uh, order of traffic and weather in the cockpit. You can get uh, TIS and FIS. TIS is traffic information in the cockpit and FIS is, is, is weather information in the, in the cockpit. And you can get that information today, again, if you're equipped with ADS-B or if you have uh, an iPad and have the app, you can get that information today from this network. Meanwhile, on the left coast, the city of Man Santa Monica said it would appeal a recent court decision that threw out a lawsuit seeking to release the city from its obligation to keep Santa Monica Municipal Airport open and operating. The city attorney announced plans to appeal during a closed-door city council meeting last week. The paperwork for the appeal had to be filed Monday. No word yet whether or not they actually did it, but stay tuned. There's another airport with a long history of facing shutdown. Even members of the airport authority have gone on the attack. The majority of the community supports it, but some wanted to develop the land into other things. And no, it's not Santa Monica we're talking about this time. AOPA Live's Paul Harrop traveled to Smithfield in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He found that fighting the good fight for airports is worth it in the end. It's a rainy and cold Indiana day, but you're looking at one of the hottest places in town. It hasn't always been that way. Smith Field has a long history. It's been around airlines. since the airmail days. Greg Brown is our airport support <laughs> network volunteer. He's had an airplane here for more than three decades. There were about 100 airplanes on this airport when I first got here. Went down to about 50, and that's about where it is now, 50 to 60. In that time, Smithfield has faced several attempts to shut it down. Once in the 1970s, again in the 90s, and the one in 2000 almost worked. The airport authority voted to close the airport. The case was, it wasn't they were bad people. They were being fed facts by people that led them to believe that there was no future in general aviation with single engines, small airplanes, and um, that just wasn't true. Members of the community banded together, helped by AOPA. They formed SAFE, or Smithfield Forever. With yard signs and advocacy, they fought to keep their airport. The supporters were not just pilots. They were the neighbors, the community, the, the city citizens that, that all joined in. And it worked. And it grew. Like, like 10 years ago, there were two, two rental airplanes from the flight school. And now it's like seven or eight. And it grew into new hangars and an expanded FBO and a thriving pilot community. The airport got this way ever since its beginning, from the enthusiasm, the excitement of aviation, but not only that, a community that supported it. And it's really growing and it's active. We've got a lot of pilots get their ratings here, both private and instrument. And now, two more pilots will earn their certificates here, and it's all because of SAFE. <laughs> all the community's support against the closing included monetary donations. And now that the airport is thriving again. What do you do with this money? You can't really give it back. And this is our way of giving it back, I guess. This is our way. SAFE exhausted its funds by providing a $5,700 flight training scholarship to each of these two teenagers, giving them the ability to be the next generation at an airport that's seen so much. In Fort Wayne, Indiana, Paul Harrop, AOPA Live. And folks, that's what it's all about. That's why we have to fight to keep at-risk airports open. Both the boys who earn the scholarships are 16. One hopes to fly for the airlines. The other wants to be a missionary pilot. Go get them, guys. When we come back, a hangar full of warbirds and giving back never felt so good. You're watching AOPA Live this week. Welcome back. You're watching AOPA Live this week. The AOPA Foundation is supporting nonprofit aviation organizations that are doing good for humanity. Last year, the foundation established its Giving Back Awards and gave $10,000 each to deserving organizations. One of those grants went to the Air Care Alliance. The Air Care Alliance is an umbrella organization for the more than 65 volunteer pilot groups and other groups involved in charitable aviation, volunteer-based charitable aviation. And we have conferences and provide support for all of the groups. We represent them before the regulatory uh, agencies and the various aviation associations in Washington and around the country. In the lives of thousands of patients, 
and uh, their families. The volunteer pilots have made a huge difference in terms of providing transportation for medical care, for diagnostics, and other medical purposes. In addition, many of the volunteer pilots in their groups are willing to fly to help following disasters. So following Loma Prieta, Katrina, uh, the, the uh, earthquake in Haiti and other disasters. Many missions were flown for disaster support. The Air Care Alliance is using the grant to hire a part-time volunteer coordinator. Well, Google is getting into the drone business, or rather they bought one, Titan Aerospace, the new Mexico-based developer of high-altitude unmanned aircraft systems. Vern Rayburn launched Titan Aerospace after he left Eclipse. He told AOPA that Google has an enlightened view to develop something that's never been done before. The idea is to use the solar-powered high-altitude drones to provide Wi-Fi internet service all over the globe. You can read more on AOPA.org. An Ohio drone operator, though, is facing charges for interfering with the flight of a medical helicopter. Kelly Stanley was using a small drone to take video of an accident scene that he planned to give to local TV stations. A sheriff deputy asked him to stop so the chopper could land. Authorities say he refused. The charge is felony obstruction of official business. We haven't heard if the FAA is going to weigh in on that one. Our first AOPA fly-in at San Marcos, Texas is fast approaching. And like all things Texas, it promises to be big. So big, in fact, that we've added a reliever airport. New Braunfels Regional, about 15 nautical miles southwest of San Marcos, There will be free shuttles between Braunfels and San Marcos all day Saturday. And if you'd like to arrive early on Friday, you can get a special fuel discount. Check AOPA.org for arrival and departure information and other information. There are a lot of interesting things to see and do in San Marcos if you arrive early, like the commemorative Air Force hangar and museum. Here at uh, San Marcos, we're the only World War II hangar that's remaining from the ones that uh, were originally constructed here at Ar- Gary Army Airfield back in World War II in 1942 when it was a training base for helicopters and for uh, navigators, as well as light aircraft. So we have 14 warbirds here in the hangar and they all fly. Uh, right now they're in various stages of repair for our annual inspections that we do every year during the winter time, but they all fly. Our B-25 was built in 1943. The Yellow Rose is the name on it. And uh, she was built in 1943 and came in toward the end of the war, was used as a trainer mainly at that time. The uh, CAF picked it up in in the 1980s. I had it reconfigured to a World War II configuration with a paint scheme that is uh, from the 340th Bomb Group in North Africa. Anybody can come in, walk through the hangar, uh, no charge. We ask for a donation of a couple of dollars, uh, three dollars, if uh, you have a mind to, but uh, it's free. We have a World War II museum that has a lot of artifacts in it that are really neat. Uh, you can spend several hours here in the hangar. One of the things we have in our museum is the actual piece of armor plating that was behind Jimmy Doolittle's seat on his B-25. In 1994, his navigator went back to China and found the actual crash site, along with the help of some Chinese, went in and brought some memorabilia back from that their airplane, and he donated uh, the piece of armor plating from Doolittle's airplane to us here in the museum. And we hope to see you in San Marcos as well. And that is a wrap for us this week. A reminder, if you'd like to share our, vid- our videos on Facebook or Twitter, just hover your mouse over the video while it's playing and the share buttons will pop up. We'd appreciate that. And we'll be back here next Thursday. Hope you are too. Until then, I'm Tom Haynes. Thanks for watching.